Well, welcome, friends, to the Periodic Table of History. This is where we jump in our time machine and study history in four dimensions. You can see three of our dimensions here, and then we can look over to the Periodic Table of History and see our fourth dimension, which is time. We're going to be looking at the United Kingdom in the present day, what led up to the history into the present day. So you can observe where I've highlighted the area in the lower left of the screen. Uh, that's going to hit into India's history, also United States history, and it will reach down into Dahomey, into Africa. So we know what it looks like right here, and this is what we're going to be studying, the United Kingdom. And now let's use our time machine and go back to the map of Ptolemy. This is from Claudius Ptolemaeus, and he lived from 100 to 170 AD. The map is thought to have been produced in 150 AD. It is a phenomenal map because I just want to draw your attention to the Vikings trade routes. You can see all the rivers the Vikings traversed on, and you can see how much of the world was known to the Romans and the Greeks nearly 2,000 years ago. Take special note of the trade routes that go up and down the Nile. Some of them are the river routes, the Nile itself, and then right next to that you can see the land routes that then connect to other rivers that traverse across Africa. Also, it's incredible to take a look at the Silk Road and the trade route that goes up into Siberia, the Indian River Ganges, and also the Chinese River called the Yangtze. You can even see Indonesia over there on the east side and up into the Pacific. So this map from 150 AD is something that I can study for hours thinking about the people groups and how they got from one place to another. Also when you look at that map you can see the kind of obstacles that the United Kingdom has to get over so that it can keep its razor's edge on the exploration front. It's competing heavily with Portugal. We can go down to Africa and we can look at the Barbary Coast also. This Barbary Coast was the area where pirates frequented. It was about from Morocco over to Tripoli in Libya. The Portuguese were acquiring an incredible amount of wealth and the English and the Portuguese had a exceedingly strong alliance. Though slavery was a huge part of Viking culture, and then you have Viking influence into the United Kingdom, the Christianization of the various people groups throughout time shunned it, at least on the Isle of the United Kingdom. Well, the United Kingdom started seeing how much wealth Portugal was acquiring, and they couldn't let that stand. The English started getting it into their heads that they could use their naval fleet as a major power for exploration and trading and maybe even get over to India. As opportunity, technology, and exploration intersected, the slave trade was started up again in England in 1632. So let's zoom up to this time period. We had been learning about Charles I, but would he have done it if he knew what kind of an empire it was going to create? So we can go to our map here, and though the fundamental idea was to trade with India, with so much contact with the Portuguese, who had undergone the slave trade, England attached itself to the Atlantic slave trade. So let's turn that route on right now. You can see what happened with it as it started over here in London, made its way over to Portugal, bounced off that country, and then came down here to Africa, these countries down here around the Ivory Coast, they were very big slave traders. They were a result of the Islamic expansion and had no problem enriching themselves by selling their brothers to the Europeans. We'll zoom out a bit here so that we can look at what was really going on on planet Earth. The Muslim countries in North Africa and in the Middle East dominated trade. So the only thing England could do is to work itself off into the Atlantic because the big goal was to trade with India. But as you can see, England had to go across the Middle East to get to India. Theories started coming about. Can we get over there by ship? 
And then, based upon what they discovered here in Africa, the slave trading that went on very heavily in Africa, this opened up a bigger can of worms than maybe anybody could at first imagine. But you can see the route goes over here to South America. Most of the slaves were actually sold into South America. Central America was also a huge destination. And then a couple of the ports that are worth mention are Charleston, South Carolina, and New York City, New York. Those were the big destinations. We can simplify it in one degree, perhaps, if we, if we come up with a simpler route. It started with industrial goods in Britain, went to Africa, went over to the United States, and then back to the United Kingdom. So that's the triangular fashion of what the United Kingdom was doing. And as far as New York goes, Wall Street is called Wall Street because they used to line the slaves up along Wall Street. So Wall Street in New York City has a very sinister history that clashes with my ideals. The bankers in each section made their money, but of course the peasantry had to pay the price. England was incredibly industrialized. Then you have the Muslim and African businessmen getting its share, but what that led to was conquest, where one group of people would steal people, men stealers, they would steal from another group of people, maybe some tribe that's right next to them. So you can imagine living in Africa in that time and even up into relatively recently, and there is still slavery going on in Africa to this day. So that gives you an idea of the Muslim businessmen in Africa. They wanted to gain access to the industrial goods of England. The United States was used primarily as an agricultural base, it supplied agricultural products to the rest of the colonies. Colonies of England getting bigger and bigger because this is a very domineeringly English time of expansion. The Atlantic slave trade is not the only thing that's going on. 1642 into 1727, the life of Isaac Newton. So Isaac Newton would have known all of these leaders here, Charles II, James II. William and Mary, Queen Anne, and George I. Isaac Newton revolutionized math and science. He actually invented calculus in England, as far as England is concerned. And then he wrote more on theology than science. That's a fact that's not very well known because modern universities are trying to push God out of the classroom as much as possible. In their thinking, anyone that's rational and smart is an atheist, and anyone that's a fool is someone that believes in God. So then when you have a lot of these inventors, which is really almost all of them being creationists and Christians and very interested in theology with the absolutism of God being the basis for their mathematics, they are usually censored by the modern-day university priests. That's just an outcropping of the humanism enlightenment mentality nowadays. Another person in just about this same period of time is Thomas Savory. He lived from 1650 to 1715 and created the first English steam pump in 1698. This led to the motor and to the Industrial Revolution of 1760. So we'll move down a little bit farther in time and come to King George III because he reigned during the Industrial Revolution. King George III is known in America as the King of England at the time of the Revolutionary War. In 1763, England's considerable debt was increasing to the point that King George III ordered the colonies to become more productive and to be taxed more to pay this debt. Now, 1763 is also the time of Robert Clive. You can look into the Siege of Arcot. This is concerning the East Indian Company. So let's go back to the map. We can zoom out on the map and just look at how far away India is from the United Kingdom. But because of this naval empire that's now traveling around Africa, the United Kingdom starts to make trade deals with India. This leads to the East Indian Company, and Robert Clive is a part of this East Indian Company, the EIC. 
he defeated a lot of the pirates around India, because as you can imagine, this area around Somalia up into the Indian Ocean is riddled with pirates, just like the Vikings riddled Europe with its piracies. Uh, there was a very fluent trade route going from East Africa into India. And because of all that transportation, that's breeding more thieves that are in this area. So one of the things that Clive did well was to defeat the pirates in this area. So he made trade alliances with India and then started into trade alliances with Bangladesh. Clive would go on escapades and try to get honor and fortune, and then he would bring that back to the United Kingdom thinking he could work his way into the nobility. He did this multiple times, and actually he was quite a good general, but that just means you're very good strategically, and that means a whole lot of people end up getting killed. So in one sense, he's looked at as a hero, and in another sense, he's looked at as a terrorist villain. When he decides to go back to the United Kingdom, after a few of his excursions, the East Indian Company ends up being filled with corruption because it gets into a very greedy, sinister part of its history. And that leads to higher taxation, that leads to famine, which leads to some people in this area having extraordinarily strong feelings against Robert Clive. We can take a look at this funny quote by Narayan Singh. He's an Indian official. He says, What honor is left to us when we have to take orders from a handful of traders who have not yet learned how to wash their bottoms? Now, Robert Clive racked up a considerable amount of debt that was taken on by the United Kingdom, and so an outcome of this could have been the destruction of the British bank. The king was not about to take that route. He decided rather he would raise taxes yet again so that he could pay this debt. You could call this the financial crisis of the United Kingdom. The EIC was too big to fail. So this brunt was given to the United States. That happened in 1773. So on the grand scope of history, we have King George III over here in England. We have the EIC over in India. This causes catastrophic bank failure in Great Britain, which then causes catastrophic failure over into the United States because of the Boston Tea Party in 1773. There is a rather extraordinary document procured by the United States of America. And remember, this wasn't the United States of America at this point. In the United States, the colonies thought of themselves as a colony of the king. So they referred to King George III as their king. But because of these taxes, some of the people in the original 13 colonies were not so sure about whether they really wanted to go through with these incompetent decisions by King George III. And remember, King George III, he just has this huge expanding empire that he's trying to hold together. The United Kingdom can't see what America is doing. America can't see what India is doing. And India can't see what the United Kingdom is doing. So we just have this failure to communicate, of course, by it taking so long for the ships to go to and from all these different destinations on a huge nationalistic industrial scale. In October of 1774, you can read a little bit into this plan of association and you can probably look into this document. It is astounding because you can look at how the American people aren't really keen on this East India tea and look at number two, we will neither import nor purchase any slave imported after the first day of December next, after which time we will wholly discontinue the slave trade and will neither be concerned in it ourselves nor will we hire our vessels nor sell our commodities or manufacturers to those who are concerned in it. So this is an incredible document that's putting sanctions against Great Britain because of slavery and taxation. So the Continental Congress is put together, and it is phenomenal to read the documents in this era. 
And then, of course, King George III believes in this law and order totalitarianism. How can these people in the United States ever defy him? And, of course, I mean, think about the ramifications of what's going on here. So the United States put together the Plan of Association. This document was rejected by George III, and then the United States revolted, leading to the 1776 establishment of the United States as a country instead of a colony of Great Britain. I encourage you to study this time. It is mind-blowing what is going on right here. During this time, we see a lot of exploration in the South Pacific. So James Cook circumnavigates New Zealand, 1769, and now the English Empire expands even more. And of course, with expansion, it needs more money. We'll come back over here to the United Kingdom and speak a little bit about the aftermath of the loss of the United States. In 1787, evangelical English Protestants and Quakers, led by William Wilberforce, formed the Committee for the Abolition of the Slave Trade. So the United States talked about it. They wanted to build the United States without slavery. They were angry that they couldn't get out from under King George, and King George wouldn't listen, about how unpopular the slave trade was. And then a lot of talks started happening about this subject, so it changed the narrative of what was going on. Now, in the United States at this time, the rich people thought they would give up their slaves eh, when they die. But their children were also the rich people, and they did not want to give up their slaves. So that's the discussion of another video. So in 1787, William Wilberforce started the ball moving towards the destruction of the slave trade. And we'll zoom out here just a bit and talk about Ireland. In 1801, Ireland merged with Great Britain, and that was renamed the United Kingdom. So you can see this end to Ireland right here. You can see George III here, and then you can see over here in the United Kingdom that there George III goes on. We have the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. So this is when the United Kingdom in name started popping up. So still in the time of George III, we can go over to Australia. In 1803, Matthew Flinders was the first to circumnavigate Australia. So, I mean, just technology and exploration, science is just booming during this time. The Protestant Reformation is lending people's thinking to this idea that answers absolutely can be found because of the idea of God being absolute. So now science is flowering out into this machine of discovery based upon this shift in people's thinking that not everything is the answer, but there is just one answer, a monotheist idea that God is absolute and there is a real answer and that God put order into the universe. So knowledge is being accumulated during this time like never before. So all of the force of William Wilberforce pays off in 1807. The Abolition Act of 1807 is passed, and this systematically shuts down the slave trade. See, the hands of government move slowly, and sometimes people aren't listening. But when people start to listen, and the righteous start to rise up, and the people and the government and God all start coming into phase to care about people, you start seeing things happen in the world. So keep in mind during this time, England is threatened by Napoleon of France. In 1815, at the Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon is defeated and the French dominance is now reduced drastically. Moving our time machine from the War of Napoleon, now we can get down into domestic matters again, and we see in 1833, this is the official time when the slave trade is actually ended the United Kingdom's abolition of the slave trade affects Africa significantly because the nobility of Africa is getting rich off of selling their brothers. But King Gezo of Dahomey, he says, The slave trade is the ruling principle of my people. It is the source and the glory of their wealth. 
The mother lulls the child to sleep with notes of triumph over an enemy reduced to slavery. He's with his umbrella, his gold bracelets, and his royal robes, and that just isn't the case for the slaves. And just on the subject of Africa, Niger outlawed slavery in 2003. Mauritania here outlawed slavery in 2007. And Chad outlawed slavery in 2017. I mean, you think about that. That was just a few years ago. It's insane. And there's still slavery going on today. So thank you to all the people that took Jesus seriously when he said, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now there was a potato famine from 1845 to 1852. The Irish population was cut in half because of the famine itself and the immigration. This affected the United Kingdom as the next neighbor to Ireland. Now I shudder to think of what happened in 1859 because this takes us to an inflection point in the fabric of history. This was the time when Charles Darwin wrote his book called The Preservation of Preferred Races. Speaking of preservation of preferred races, his turtle was named Harriet, and that turtle watched him write this book on the survival of the fittest. Now, Darwin died, but Darwin's turtle survived him and lived in Brisbane, Australia, until 2006. So if Harriet was alive today, I think Harriet would have a lot to say about the preservation of preferred races. So this work was worshipped by Hitler, Stalin, the rich elites ever since. Tragically, it got introduced into the school system and it started a domino effect of destroying the culture of Christianity ever since. The USA rejected it up until the 1960s, but now even the USA is inflicted with this idea of getting rid of God and only relying on oneself. A very, very dangerous idea. And though I'm sad to say, just about every zoo that I've ever visited all across the world, including China, are teaching Darwinian evolution. This idea that it's expedient for the strong to get rid of the weak, and that set up the building blocks into the world wars into the 20th century. This religion stipulated that it was okay to run over people like a Mack truck, and it didn't matter what the consequences were. So this was a tragedy for everyone after this point. Though I have lots to say on this subject, I'll skip by and just move on. There was a double-stranded movement that grew out of the abolitionist movement in the United States and the abolitionist movement of the United Kingdom. The two strands were the abolition of slavery and the woman's suffrage movement. Those were moving at the same time. And in both of these countries, slavery was defeated by this time. And then the suffragette movement broke ground in 1903 with Emmeline Pankhurst. You can see here's a poster on this subject. When the powerful people don't have eyes to see God or ears to hear God, they just view people as machines. This is something that happened from the Enlightenment movement in thinking of people only as pieces of a machine. When you get rid of the living God, you stop seeing a person as human. You start seeing them as a cog in the machine. So when Emmeline Pankhurst was giving them problems, getting arrested, and then going into fasts, the elite said, this is not going to happen on our watch. So you can see them force-feeding her in that poster, a tragedy. Well, survival of the fittest was now taking hold in Europe, and there were alliances that had been formed. You have a strong alliance with England, France, and Russia, and Belgium was to be defended from Germany. The other alliance was Italy, Austria, Hungary, and Germany. The straw that broke the camel's back was the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand in 1914, and that set off World War I. It was just like a domino effect all over the earth. 
The Ottoman Empire jumped on this as it saw this was its chance to destroy Europe in a blow. So you have alliance upon alliance all over the earth, everybody asking help of the next neighbor and the next neighbor and the next neighbor until the whole world is engulfed in a war. We can see the Ottoman Empire right here, and it lasted for so long. I'll zoom in. Here, 1299, Osman I. Because of its alliance with the Axis power, and the Axis power being defeated, the Allied powers forced the Ottoman Empire to give up land and break up its empire. This was actually very incredible because the Ottoman Empire was so powerful in the Middle East. There's a huge Catholic and Protestant break in Ireland, and so because of all the huge war debt, once again, of the United Kingdom, there is opportunity to create an Irish free state, and that's what happened here. So let's look on the map, and we can see that if you ever wondered why this border was written like it is, you have Northern Ireland here and then Ireland, it's because of World War I and the aftermath negotiations. Irish Free State was set up. Moving on just a bit farther, we come to George VI, King George VI. Well, we have to think back to that book called The Preservation of Preferred Races. Well, the academic university types, they had decided they would teach that as religion. That would be their religion so that they could reject Christianity. And since this ideology said survival of the fittest, and this was being taught for the last 60 years now, you have three full 20-year generations that have been fed this idea that they are better than somebody else. But other countries have been thinking they're better than everyone else too, because this is a buzz around Europe. So Hitler pushes the idea of evolution to its proper place, and that is to kill all the inferiors. That is the logical conclusion of this philosophy. So Hitler becomes entrenched in the Socialist Party, or the Socialist German Workers' Party, what we know as the Nazi Party. Hitler invades Poland, and the United Kingdom declares war on Germany. This becomes the prime time of Winston Churchill. It's interesting to note a few of the ideologies that were put forth by Hitler. One of the slogans put forth by Hitler is, What luck for rulers that men do not think. Another thing he said is, I use emotion for the many and reserve reason for the few. And still, to conquer a nation, first disarm its citizens. When I hear that third quote, I think back to Julius Caesar in his time, a little before the time of Christ and his disarmament of the Gauls. So Hitler, as the hardened evolutionist, came up with this quote also, The stronger must dominate and not mate with the weaker, which would signify the sacrifice of its own higher nature. Only the born weakling can look upon this principle as cruel, and if he does so, it is merely because he is of a feebler nature and narrow mind. For if such a law did not direct the process of evolution, then the higher development of organic life would not be conceivable at all. Some people say Hitler was insane, but actually he was doing exactly what his professors taught him to do. It's a shuddering thought to me. So here's a diagram that shows the rise and fall of the kingdoms. Liberalism is freedom without order. Tyranny is order without freedom. What I've always found amazing is that the United States disarmed these two mechanisms because it is freedom with order. The catch is the submission to the living God, Jesus Christ. Because when you have love for people, then any extreme can look at the other one still with respect. 
But when you take this Christianity mechanism out of the equation, all you're left with is liberalism or tyranny. And on one side, you have freedom that demands order, like people want to be free, liberal, they can live their life like they want, and then they shoot each other. And then that leads to tyranny, which is order, which says you can't have a gun. If you can't have a gun, now you have to elect a bully to impose its order on everybody. It has to impose its rules on everybody, like the Russian Revolution. But liberalism leads to tyranny. And in a tyrannical form of government, people yearn for freedom. The only way this is disarmed is if you have love for each other. So we are entering a very interesting period of time where the universities have removed God from the classroom. A liberal country like France is looked down upon as weak and inferior by a tyrannical form of government, of order, of the Nazis, of the socialist Germans. By the same rate, France views Germany as oppressive. See, the two countries cannot overlap. You can play this game with any country. You can look at the liberal form of freedom that the United States have and compare that with the tyrannical form of communism, say like in China. Well, China will view the United States as incredibly weak. The liberal form of government in the United States will view China as very oppressive. The only way to bridge this gap and create optimal conditions for the citizenry is to have freedom with order. That can't be done by kicking Jesus Christ out of the classroom, but that's what we've done. World War II created a rift across the fabric of time. Everyone had to pick sides, so this was a huge time for revolutionary governments to take hold. Well, World War II was almost like a reenactment of World War I. The Islamic countries saw this as a way to weaken the other nations around the world, but since they were allied with Germany, and Japan, they had to, once again, give up land. So the lines in the Middle East are drawn up, and the pieces are distributed to the Allied Powers, which are going to be Russia, France, United Kingdom, United States. So the modern world is really just a continuation of the same old drama. And Israel becomes a nation in 1948, so this leads to a lot of resentment from the Islamic world that was trying to destroy all the other countries in the world, and now it got cut up into these slices, administered by foreign forces like Russia, or France, or Great Britain, or the United States. So there's an explosive amount of resentment energy here in the Middle East. So England played a major role in the establishment of Israel as a nation. So Elizabeth II takes us into the present age. She is probably one of the most fascinating people on the planet. Now I saw today, April the 9th, 2021, that her husband, Prince Philip, died. And I am definitely sorry for her loss. May Prince Philip rest in peace. Now as concerning Elizabeth II, if I were allowed to talk to a single person in the present age, I would pick... Elizabeth II. She has been a stateswoman through this most interesting era of technology, the 1950s into present day. She's had the opportunity to meet with delegates, dignitaries, princes and kings all over the world in this present era. I wonder what stories she would tell. The story from Adam to Elizabeth II is intellectually provocative. I hope you've enjoyed learning as I have, and I hope the periodic table of history gives you an appreciation for history and a tangibility. The United Kingdom led the way for an amazing amount of technology. First metro system, the first text message, the first stamps and letters, sewing machine, the fire extinguisher, the steam engine, the electric motor, the telegraph, the railway, William Shakespeare, Charles Dickens, Sir Isaac Newton, 
How many music artists can you think of that came from the United Kingdom? David Bowie or Led Zeppelin, The Beatles or Pink Floyd? You can leave your thoughts in the comment section. And as always, I hope the best for you. I hope you have a great week, and I hope you're able to help somebody this week. I'll see you in the next video.